Wow. Wow. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. <laughs> so, so we are here, and uh, please, uh, this is your. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, today, uh, well, I was thinking what to present, really. And uh, one thought that I had is uh, we're all missing out on the physical racing uh, this year. So I thought, like, maybe people would be interested in having a look at the Deep Racer as a car and what it looks like and what it is like to race it today. So we're actually going to try and do all of it today. Uh, but uh, actually, we're also going to try and uh, calibrate a car, pretty much prepare it for the racing as well. So what's being happen what's happening during the races that are happening, uh, that are taking place at the summits or the meetups or or in the finals when they happen in real world. Um, yeah. And uh, yes. So I'm a lead developer at Open Market, and uh, we are a company that uh, helps customers communicate at a scale, mainly over SMS, but we are also offering uh, rich communication services, which are a new product for messaging uh, emerging in the world, also MMS and things like that. Um, I'm also an AWS hero, as Carlos mentioned, uh, machine learning hero. Uh, and the AWS DeepRacer community leader uh, and finalist this year and last year as well. Also, I like baking bread. That's why pretty much if you look for me on the internet, you will find a lot of photographs of bread and me with it. Uh, and I like blogging as well. Uh, so every now and then I publish something. Um, yeah, before I actually talk about the uh, Deep Racer uh, as a car, I just want to mention one thing that uh, changed in the uh, virtual races uh, this month. So uh, AWS have released an update to community races. There is an option in which you can um, set up a new race in uh, set up a new race in uh, in the console for your for you and your friends until now it was only time trial and beginning uh, this month you can also set up object avoidance or head-to-head -head races uh, i can show it uh, at a later time if if we still have time but in general you get more configuration options over there it's still not head-to-head -head, it's more head to bot really uh, because you cannot compete against another racer like you do in the physical races uh, in the season. Uh, but yeah, it's already, it, it's still evolving and uh, hopefully we'll also get head-to-head -head races and challenges at some point. Um, I've also mentioned the Deep Racer League finals. So uh, both in 2019 and in 2020, I have qualified for the uh, races uh, in, in the finals, which should happen in Vegas. Uh, in uh, during the reinvent, unfortunately this year it's not happening. That's why the uh, the finals are just going on to going online, and it will be organized in multiple rounds. Uh, there will be a first round in which we will do time trials in groups, and the best results from those groups will move on to the next part, which will be object avoidance, and then after that we will have head to head competition. Uh, it's quite likely that it will also involve physical racing, so we won't be able to be there, obviously. But uh, if you're following the community, there is an initi initiative called uh, Underground Deep Racer, which is uh, run by um, John Meyer, uh, who is a, like AWS uh, blogger, and by David Smith, the uh, public sector uh, solutions architect from London. So they have tracks and they have cars and they organize streaming live on Twitch. And the next one is happening on Tuesday. So if you have some models that you've trained and you're curious how they are doing on the track, what you can do is send your model to David Smith and he will load it onto a car and he will race it around the track on Tuesday. And then you can just watch how it did. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's quite likely that the format that will be also used during the uh, during the finals we'll all see, and uh, the, it will also contain some um, 
videos uh, after each round, there will be some footage that will be released by AWS to pretty much update on the progress of the finals. Uh, unfortunately, we're not meeting in Vegas, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to just make it up next year and, and have fun together then. So yeah, uh, just a quick reminder of what AWS Deep Racer is. So it's an 118th scale car, uh, like that, yeah. Uh, and uh, it has a computer on it. Uh, it has some sensors or inputs and they are being used to train uh, to, they are being used as input for convolutional ne neural network that uh, pretty much the output of it is some decision about behavior of the car. And yeah, you're responsible for training this network. There is a console online and there are races both in league and you can organize your own as a community races. You can race virtually and you can race physically. So today we're gonna really focus on how to get this baby going. And uh, yeah, if you buy a deep racer, you get something like this a box more or less this size. And uh, it has a small compartment at the bottom and above this, there is well, this, the car. Uh, if you get an Evo, which is the newer one that was released this year, then you get a bit more. So it looks more or less like this. Um, so in, apart from the car, it's really like two boxes that you get. One is the car and the second one is an extension kit, uh, which contains a, an extra camera, a few cables, a little rubbery thing that I had no idea what it was for until I just remembered after a while. Uh, it's pretty much just for to put on a battery because it's quite, uh, the batteries are, either a bit shorter or a bit longer, depending on which model you get. And uh, you can just add it. I, it's not really necessary. And you even get a screwdriver to pretty much assemble it. So uh, we're going to have a look at, at it all in a bit. Uh, so uh, Carlos, if we could just switch over to camera, because I'll be just uh, opening the car for a moment. And uh, we can get back to slides at a later time. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, please. Uh, that's it. Right, let me just move the mic. Sorry for noise. Yeah. So, uh, this is what the car looks like. You can see it has a, a shell, which everyone keeps thinking that this is the back because, like, you know, fast cars normally have the front lower. No, it's not, not the case because it has a camera over here, as you can see. I haven't removed the protection film from it, but uh, you can do that. Uh, in Evo, it's slightly different, as in the the film has matte finish, so the whole shell looks like with a nice matte finish. I th I thought it was not the film, it, so I removed it, and it turns out that now I have a shiny shell. I prefer the matte version, but uh, oh, tough luck. So yeah, it has a hole for a camera over here and it's being held with a few pins on top. If we remove the shell, what you get over here is uh, obviously there is an RC car part, which is I think a stock car that we identified which car it is uh, in uh, on Amazon. And uh, you can also buy the spare parts because the list of parts is available also in the documentation. And on top of it, there is a computational unit. It's pretty much an Ubuntu computer, like Deep Lens, uh, with a Deep Lens camera on, in front. You have a USB hub in front, so it's just stuck over here. And, uh, and a battery. It actually normally has two batteries. Uh, I, I will need to put a second one in. Uh, but yeah, if maybe I can just remove this part to show you. So yeah, the computational module is held onto it with some pins as well. 
And you can see there is a base over here, which is pretty standard car. Uh, I think it's even like not like top shelf shelf car. It's it's just a pretty basic one. And and there is a computer on top of it. It has Intel and Atom inside, a few USB ports. Some uh, there you can put a micro SD card into it. Uh, you can attach it to a computer with a micro USB, and then it behaves as it as if it was a network card. I think, and an HDMI port, because what you can do is you can just attach it to a monitor, attach a compute, uh, a keyboard, a mouse, and just log into it as if it was a regular computer. It's running Ubuntu 16.10 or 16.4, I don't remember. Uh, and uh, on it, there is a robotic operating system installed. And the system has, uh, uh, well, the system also, uh, the system is uh, like integrated with uh, the camera and other sensors if they can be attached. For now, in, in the basic one, there's only a camera really that we are using. Um, so yeah, uh, I've mentioned that there's a battery. So on top of it, there's a battery that powers the computer. Uh, it's a rather big one and quite powerful one. So it's being connected with the USB-C to provide enough power to the computer. But there's also another battery that we need to put. Oh yeah, by the way, if uh, there are two series of these cars, slightly older ones go with those batteries and the newer ones have slightly bigger batteries. Uh, these are pretty much, uh, I've noticed that this is a Dell battery, but these are actually a stock hybrid power adapters from Dell. So if you have a Dell computer, what you can do is there's a second part with a charger that goes on to here and you can use it as your power uh, power supply. Uh, it doesn't have enough power to power your laptop, but well, it will, uh, all, it will drain quite quickly and I'm not sure if it's gonna actually charge when you just attach it to a computer and to power supply. But I've been using it like this, and then when I had to disconnect, I still had power supply in use. You can see that they are slightly different in size. And uh, one thing that's quite characteristic for the old car is that it has a little fin over here, plastic one. So if I try to put this battery in here, you can see that it won't fit. Uh, so yeah, you can either cut it out or if you get this one, you will get the newer bracket as well. So it should just fit over here. But uh, yeah, that's something that I realized when I was assembling the Evo, because uh, if you don't have this part over here, you can slide this battery out quite easily. If you have it, you need to disassemble the car to get the battery out, which is a bit of an inconvenience. So it's better to just cut it flat if you can. Um, so yeah, we're going to just turn it on right now. And while it's turning on, we're going to just attach the battery for for the car part. Um, yes, yeah, so I will just push the power button over here and let it power on. Uh, and in the meantime, I will try to get the cable out to connect the regular ba the RC battery. RC batteries are LiPo ones, uh, which is a lithium polymer. Um, I get, I got the tester for them. So uh, this one should be just charged over here. Let's double check. You can see that this one is fully charged right now. Uh, they come in two versions. One of them is uh, this black one and another one, which is, I think it's the only one supplied at the moment, uh, the, the black one, but there's another one which is uh, blue. It's slightly bigger um, capacity, but it doesn't have a protection against dying. Uh, so the lithium polymer batteries apparently have this uh, bad habit of exploding or pretty much just going into flames if they get discharged too far. 
So the, the blue ones are not being sold because of that. The black ones have the protection circuit. So if, it, if the you know, current goes below a certain value, uh, they will switch off and you need to reset them to charge them and use them again. Uh, so they are quite safe, uh, at least safer, yeah? So we're going to just connect it uh, with one set of, you can see it has a different set uh, of uh, connectors. This one goes for charging and this one is using, used for just driving. I'm just going to put it over here. Right. And uh, yeah, we can just switch the, you can see that uh, the LED, LED at the end uh, went on at some point. But also you can see that I've got two LEDs over here. One of them is for the power and the second one is for Wi-Fi. So this means that we're on Wi-Fi. I'm actually gonna change the direction of this battery because I just want to shorten the wires a little bit so that they don't get into the wheels. Uh, yeah, so this is what the car looks like when it's turned on and uh, I'm just going to leave it like this and I'm going to show you an Evo now. It's already assembled, so I'm not going to show how to assemble it. But, uh, well, it's not fun looking at me just, you know, putting some screws in and, and stuff. So I'm just going to spare you that. Um, so Evo, you can say that it looks like a shark. Just a little bit on, gonna try a different perspective. Yep, so this is what Evo looks like. And uh, the difference is that in Evo, you remove, the, you could see like those two forks that are holding the shell. Uh, you remove them and instead of them, you install a bigger bracket like this thing. The whole thing over here is a, new bit that you put in here and it has a lidar on top of it so lidar is a laser something detection uh yeah something detection uh radar pretty much uh but yeah, i don't remember what the, what the acronym is but in general what it does is it just emits a laser beam and over here i will show you it has a Two holes you can see and they are not at the same angle there's a slight difference between them when i switch them on i wouldn't dare to look inside but right now it's pretty much um it has a uh, one that emits a, a laser beam and the second one which uh, it has a sensor that just detects it and because it's on a base that keeps rotating all the time uh, it keeps selecting or gathering information about the whole surroundings as in what objects are in the area around it and stuff like that. And it's, it can be done like if you look on uh, for videos about LiDAR, you will see some robots going around and pretty much building a whole map of the area and where the objects are and just building lines like that. So that's one way to use it. And then you get a lot of information from it. Uh, the one that is being used over here is that uh, the data is being compiled into certain sectors and then you get information whether uh, there's something in a given sector around the car or not. And uh, yeah, something like this goes as an input next to the input from the cameras because now you've got two cameras. I've shown you that there is a USB hub right now. So right now it's being all used. Uh, I moved one camera to the side, added the second one and I've connected the LiDAR in the middle. I still have another USB port at the back over here. So uh, I'm quite used to using it because uh, in the older uh, cars, uh, the only way to load models was by attaching the USB stick and I was using this back USB for this. But also I use this to configure Wi-Fi on the car because you can use like uh, you can use the uh, micro USB port that I've mentioned. You just attach it to the computer. It detects it as a network card, 
and then there's some URL that you use and you can just reach it, reach the car and then uh, configure the Wi-Fi. Uh, what I normally do is uh, I just have a text file on a USB stick, which has the uh, network ID and password and just attach it over here. I think the general idea of the, of the USB uh, port in the back was to add a additional inference unit. So there are those, uh, like they look like small USB sticks from uh, Intel, I believe that you can just attach and they just give you extra power for inference. But for now, there hasn't been a use case for them. We haven't done like that intense stuff with the car. And uh, you can see that I've got the battery over here in the back, and obviously I've got the fin over here as well, so I cannot take it out without disassembling everything. Uh, and uh, I have the car's battery over here as well. Um, so yeah, let's just turn it on as well. And then we're going to switch over to a different screen. Come on. Yep. Yeah. There we go. So you can see that the LiDAR starts uh, rotating straight away. And uh, we've got another LED, so you can see green light over here. Actually, there are two of them, one over here and one in here in a module that connects to uh, connects the LiDAR to, over USB to the computer. Uh, so yeah, it has a bit more nice lights in here. When you put the uh, shell on, Uh, well, you've got the lighter over here. You can clearly see that um, it will not see the front because the, the, the bit at the top is uh, just blocking the, the front. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a pity that it's like that. But then also like it just uses the... Uh, so what... what you, yeah, you use the LiDAR to just detect, detect cars at the back or on the side and in the front because you've got stereo vision now. Uh, the cars, the images from the cameras are being converted into depth image, which is being used as an input for training or for racing uh, just as the LiDAR. So yeah, I think it's already on as well. And because of that, I'm just gonna uh, switch the uh, shared screen so that we can see what the um, what you can see when you connect to the car because you can connect to it and watch it in the browser Um, right, so let me just open the regular and uh, second one will be, I'm just going to open it uh, up front. Uh, yeah, too many digits. Right, so let's just uh, log in. And uh, yeah, you can see a, a spoiler right now in the screen, on the screen, uh, because today we've got a track over here. Uh, but yeah, let's not just get ahead of ourselves. Um, yeah, uh, so when you log into a car, this is how you control it, actually. You just log into it. Uh, in a browser, you get a tablet which is connected to this screen that you see right now. And what's happening over here is uh, you just choose the model. I've got a few over here. And uh, when it's loaded, then you just press start and you steer the speed, uh, well, control the speed. Um, so uh, many people are wondering what the impact is, whether they should train the car to go faster or not when they train for physical racing. This is the thing that uh, is uh, hopefully will clarify this. Uh, the speed over here is uh, like percentage of maximum 
power that you can get from a given battery, the LiPo battery that's attached to the RC car. So right now it's set to 50%, which means that if you, let's say, have uh, two speeds, um, let's say half a meter per second and one meter per second in your action space, then if the car decides to do uh, one meter per second action, it's like 100% of the speed for it, and then times the 50% over here, which means that it will apply 50% of the power of battery into the car, uh, the car's motor to just go ahead, go around. If it chooses the uh, half meter per second, then it's like 25%. Why you've got this over here, um, the cars vary. Uh, we haven't managed to crack it down really. Some of them are slightly more powerful, some are, are less. And uh, we've noticed that sometimes some cars need to, to go at close to 100% in the uh, steering over here to be able to go relatively fast. And some need to go at 30%. I'm not sure if it's the properties of the battery or if it's like a different degrees uh, in the cars. It's really hard to say right now because we haven't had enough time for training with the physical cars. This is still like we're trying to gather experiences and uh, setting up a truck isn't really easy. Uh, it's like I only managed to get this over here um, last week and this is uh, second time that I've took this truck out and I've had it since February, I believe. So yeah, we just don't get enough chances to try driving around the truck. Um, but yeah, before you start racing, maybe I'm just gonna go over other things that we've got in the uh, console. So you have a view of the models, which is quite handy. Now you don't need a USB stick to load the models onto a car. Instead, you provide a model and you can just upload it like that. And uh, just choose one from here. And then it's being uploaded. If it's accepted, you got this on the on the list over here. You can just remove a few if you don't if you don't need them. I should actually do a cleanup. Then we've got the calibration, which we're gonna do. Uh, so the cars need to be calibrated before you use them. And the recommendation is that they are being calibrated um, every uh, single time you replace the battery. Uh, so we're going to do this. We're going to actually calibrate this car because I've done the other one before the meetup just so that we save time. And there are some settings, which is uh, pretty much the network that I'm using. There is a password to access the console. You can enable SSH on the card. You can SSH onto it to fetch some information. And you can do really cool stuff with that. We've got people in the community that actually work on updated firmware so that they can fetch more information out of the car. Uh, yeah, this is one thing that we're really missing. We You don't get the logs like in the console. In the console, you, you get information in the virtual racing, obviously. You get the coordinates, you get the actions that the car took and stuff like that. You don't get it on this car. And uh, this is a terrible pity, really. <laughs> we should fix this and hopefully the community will also target the firmware at some point to just gather all this information. And one more value that you can do is uh, there have been projects uh, by Johan Luchtenborg from Amsterdam. Uh, so Johan uh, has, uh, has prepared this awesome project which builds a crad cam overlay on over the what the car sees uh, what this means is pretty much uh, it shows you what the camera sees and it shows you what has led uh, which uh, which parts of the image that the car sees in on the input cause it to trigger a certain action, which ones seem, sound like, that, well, you should just take this action, either go straight or left, faster, slower, and stuff like that. Uh, you also get information about the state of the software. Uh, it's uh, pretty handy. The only thing to bear in mind over here is that if you get one of the older cars, 
you may need to do a factory reset because there has been a security incident with uh, ROS, Robotic Operating System. Um, well, it was, I think, in May or June 2019, after which they had to replace the certificates on their servers and repositories. And because of that, the cars are configured to fetch information based on the old ones. So you need to pretty much just wipe it clean and then just reconfigure and run an update on it. It's not a problem. There is a really nice uh, documentation on what to do and how to prepare it. You just need a USB stick for resets and stuff like that. It's, it's yeah, it's really doable, but just bear that in mind that if you get a slightly older car, you will need to do this probably. Uh, and yeah, you also get the logs. So over here, you can see that it tried to like uh, bind to some ports and it failed to. Uh, you get some system logs over here as well, which tells you that, oh, for instance, here it's checked for the updates. And you can see that there are some uh, packages that are prepared by the AWS Depressor team that's being, that are being downloaded. It's literally using uh, Synaptic uh, or you know, apt to uh, fetch packages and install it on Ubuntu, and that's how you get the upgrades. It has some robotic operating system packages on it running with simulations, and also it's got some, uh, yeah, uh, it's also got some web application which actually we are looking at right now. So yeah, you've got some links over here as well to guide you at uh, like uh, how to build a track or how to train a model. And uh, and the battery state, the battery level, what I've learned is that when you are racing, it will tell you that it's lower than when it's just standing like right now over here. But yeah, for now, let's start with doing the calibration. So when we calibrate, what we need to do is uh, set a certain uh, layout for the uh, wheels and uh, and then we need to set up the speed when the car is not moving when it's moving to make sure that also to make sure that the car wheels are spinning in the right direction and uh, because sometimes they can just go backwards and then there's just a checkbox that you mark and everything just flips uh, yeah, it's pretty easy that we need to do this so that the cars behave relatively similarly. You could see that I'm using like a masking tape that comes with the car in a box. So I'm using one of those to put in here just so that the cars, the wheels move freely. Yeah, the, few, the wheels are actually four by four. So one thing that I can show you is uh, you can see that when I'm just rotating one of them, the second one is rotating in the opposite direction uh i'm not sure i'm gonna make a fool out of myself probably right now but i'm just gonna say that it's a uh, it's a differential over here i think it's a differential over here and in the back as well and that's what's making it like uh, this is what a real car also uses so that it doesn't skid when you're turning when the cars the wheels need to turn at slightly different speeds so it's using over here if i just block uh, two wheels and start rotating them and you can see that all wheels start turning. So it's very useful for 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 like terrain racing. Probably not so useful on track when it's just flat, and all the simulation assumes that everything is flat. Uh, sometimes just it's unfortunate in simulation that something is just put on the wrong level and you get a bump and the car starts jumping. But usually then it's just reported and flattened by the AWS uh, project team. Um, so yeah, uh, you put the car on uh, in the air a little bit, and then we can do the uh, calibration. So let's just go back to the uh, let's just go back to uh, the browser, and let's start the calibration. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave it out here. So first thing we need to do is set up the cars. You can see in this in the um, you can see in the picture over here that uh, usually it's being suggested that we should set the car, the left wheels to be in straight line. You pretty much need something straight to just uh, do it. I have one of those uh, LiPo guard bags for those LiPo batteries when I charge them. And 
uh, they pretty much contain like if the battery starts leaking for whatever reason they just contain it so i just use it to have the uh, reference guide for the wheels and uh, i'm just going to give you uh, move the camera a little bit so that you can see what i mean uh, actually i need to remove the shell for this so the reason why it says that we should just set the one side is um, is because uh, there is the thing called Ackermann steering applied over here, which is pretty much the same that uh, the normal parts do. And this means that uh, if you look at the wheels, they don't turn by the same angle, like left side is slightly, in this case, slightly turns slightly less than the right side. And the same thing happens when we go the other side, this one is a bit more than this one. And the, the reason for that is that, uh, because when the when you're turning a car, the radius of the inside wheels is different than the radius of the outside wheels. So instead of having just like a straight connection, uh, there it's pretty much just like a trapezoid, something like this. And then when you just um, the cars just uh, the wheels have different uh, different uh, angle until under which they turn. I'm actually, yeah, it's useful to actually switch the car on to see how you do this. And now you can see that uh, uh, I'm going to try to show you the angle that I see over here. I think the left wheels are slightly turned, so I'm just going to turn it right a little bit. Actually, I'm turning the other way around. I think they are set roughly straight right now and the the other side you can see that there is a turn that's why they will never be exactly straight that's why you need to set it on the one side only so yeah um, that's one thing and uh, I have removed one of my uh, headphones of my ear right now because we will be looking for a sound over here when we go on to the next stage. So right now we're going to set the maximum turn left and by saying that we are looking for a sound, I'm going to try to get it. I'm not sure if it's going to be heard, but there's a buzzing sound that's starting over here. Which you don't get right now, for instance. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but there is a buzzing sound, which pretty much means that the car tries to turn more than it can, but it's still pushing. So you don't want to hear this, but you want to make sure that the wheels are set to a maximum value that's still turning a little bit, which is around here for me right now. And then we're going to go to the right side. Uh, you can see that the car, the wheels will change in a bit, like this, and again. It looks like this is the maximum value for for this one. So yeah, that's for the train and for the turning, and now we're gonna move over to the second one, which is speed. For speed, it's even more important that the car is in the air, but also it's quite important to just hold it. And the reason for it is that you will set the maximum forward speed at macro speed, and uh, they are really, really, really fast, fast enough that uh, it might actually shake the car off whatever you, you're holding it on. So let's just do this. So the first one says, uh, just find value at which the car is not turning. So here you can see that it's going like backward for a moment. Here, forward. And we need to find uh, the level at which the car is stopped spinning, but it's also not giving a squeaky high frequency sound. That's just, that's just freaking me out right now. So I can hear it now and 
and I cannot hear it right now. I, I don't know whether you heard it or not, but uh, the whole rotation will be really loud. So you've heard just a bit of it right now. It will be much louder in a bit. So the next screen will be to sell, uh, check whether the car is, the wheels are spinning in the right direction because they are spinning rather fast. I normally just uh, touch them slightly on the side to see if it's in the right direction because I just cannot spot when I just look at them. So what you've heard as a drill, or I'm not sure, it must have been a horrible sound, apologies for that, but uh, yeah, that's what you hear when you calibrate the car. Normally it's being done away from the uh, microphones. So, but yeah, so the first screen that I had when you could hear me was, I was checking if it's turning in the right direction, and then the next one straight away goes on to the maximum speed, and then uh, forward, and then maximum speed backward. One thing that I actually find a bit weird is that the wheels are rather wobbly. It's not like, you know, in a normal car, something like this would mean that the car would be probably not the best ever to just put on the road. And uh, this one is rather, yeah, loose over here. But probably that's the reason. The reason is that it's based on like mid-range uh, parts. You can replace them, but no one has uh, really done it or tried to doing it just yet. Um, okay, so we've calibrated the car and the second one is also calibrated. So one, the next thing I want to show you is uh, what the car sees when it goes on track. So as you've seen, I've got a small track, which I uh, got thanks to Lyndon, uh, the leader leader of the community. Uh, he preferred the template and uh, was selling them for a brief period. I'm not sure if he's doing it still, you won't need to ask him. But yeah, pretty much just uh, we just printed three uh, vinyl banners, uh, and that's how we got the the track. I'm gonna need to put my headphones down for a moment, so I'm gonna go and put it on the uh, track, and uh, I will readjust the camera so that you can see it as well. So give me just a second. Yeah, I think that's good enough. So let's just switch over to the camera view. I'm just going to switch it to full screen temporarily. So yeah, this is pretty much what the car sees. Uh, in here, the barriers are lower than the recommended uh, recommended value. So because of that, you can see what's happening around the, around the track. But uh, we've learned that it isn't necessarily needed to have higher barriers quite often it's just enough especially on bigger trucks uh, so yeah uh, that's what we've prepared and uh, really this is just a bunch of pvc pipes connected together with uh, sleeves made out of uh, regular sheets so yeah, i like a sewing machine uh, i'd like to take it out and just give it a spin every now and then uh, so yeah, this is what the car sees. Normally during the competition, we switch the view off. And the reason for that is to save bandwidth. Uh, so normally you would just have it like that and probably just uh, zoom in as much as possible to just have as much of the view at those two buttons as possible. Because uh, when you just keep racing, you don't really watch what's on the tablet. 
and uh, you might just start misclicking and just clicking somewhere around here, for instance, or just move something and then the card is just crazy things. So yeah, normally this is what I do. I just set it to something like this on the tablet, just hide the menu as well. And then I just focus on those two buttons. Right now they are actually much bigger than they were before. Before it was like two relatively small buttons around the size of those two here. And they had a text field in the middle with this value, which I guess was handy when you did this on the computer, but not at all when you were doing it on a tablet because every now and then you would just just tap on the field and the keyboard would come up and you it would just like ruin your attempt at a given time. So yeah, that's probably what you would be doing or you will be doing when you get a chance to uh, give it a spin. And uh, there's also another mode, which is called manual mode over here. So for a moment, because I don't care about bandwidth. So yeah, by, oh yeah, I haven't explained why. We just want to switch it off. When you're racing, it really matters that the car speeds up when you want it to speed up and slows down when you want it to slow down. So at the MGM arena, there was a request for everyone to switch off as many Wi-Fi's as possible and not to turn on any random ones. And there was a separate Wi-Fi for the cars so that they didn't interfere with anything else to have slower, uh, like as little latency as possible. And yeah, uh, you would just uh, hide it to have more influence on this part over here. But right now, because I just want to show you what it looks like. Actually, I haven't never tried steering like this, so you can try right now. Uh, I will probably just suck at it because this control is uh, not the best ever. And the car is relatively fast, but let's just give it a try. And turn. Yeah, but keep going. Yay! Ah, uh, right. So what you're seeing right now is, well, what you see when the car just doesn't see anything because it just drove into a barrier. As I said, I'm not good at steering those things and uh, my algorithms are way better than me. And thank goodness for that. Uh, let me just set it, uh, move it aside a little bit. Because I have rather soft uh, carpet over here, uh, just putting out the track like this what didn't really work. So what I had to do is I've put a bunch of hardboard under uh, under it, and this way it's really nice. So hopefully my wife doesn't make me disassemble it before Christmas, and I'll have some time to just train using it. Uh, yeah, so maybe one thing, one last thing that we're going to try and do right now with this car is we're going to switch to autonomous mode and load a model. Uh, so a disclaimer, this is a difficult truck. Uh, and by difficult, I mean quite likely it's just that because it's squashed into a small space, it's roughly 220 by 330 or 350. Um, I struggled to just get around the uh, hairpin on either side. So normally it just starts turning and then uh, and then just goes into a uh, into the barrier. So probably that's what we're, we're going to see. But let's just load the model first and we're going to check what's happened. Maybe we actually get one U-turn and this will be already better than ever before. While it's loading, I'm going to have a quick look if we've got any questions. Well, now, if you've got any questions, you can just write them in Twitch on, uh, in the chat, and then I'm just going to uh, respond uh, towards the end. 
but for now let's just start uh, actually i'm just going to slow down because uh, the thing is that this car is actually quite fast and by quite fast i've seen laps under 10 seconds uh, achieved with this exact car uh after four hours of training on the reinvent 2018 track so there's something about it that it just works well with the models and we weren't able to get the same results with the same model on different car so yeah i really liked it but because of that we're starting at 30 percent and then just gonna start to speed up after until it starts rolling um so yeah let's just start and see what happens As you can see, very consistent behavior. It just drives into a wall. Uh, let's try one more time, and then we're going to switch over to an Evo. Uh, so yeah, stop. Please turn. Nope. Okay. So I'm choosing actually this model just because this is uh, the one that got me third place in uh, in AWS Summit in London in 2019. And uh, and I managed to get uh, 8 seconds, 8.2 seconds on it uh, on the reinvent 2018 track at some point as well. So I'm, I really like it. Uh, it's, it's the one that I trained in the first week of playing of the Bracer and I haven't really managed to train another good one like this one. <laughs> this is a, not for the physical car. I can get around the track and I'm happy with it, but like this one just works and uh, I'm not really sure why. So I'm still learning. Anyway, so yeah, this is the uh, regular or the Bracer classic as I, I like to call it, but I think people at AWS don't really like me calling it like this. Let's move on to the one over here. So this one, uh, I'm just going to turn the camera again. There we go. Yeah, Evo. You can see it's got two cameras. Only one of them is uh, registering the view over here. You only get like one view. You can see that this one is not being seen. But what's happening when it's going around the track, these, uh, uh, the input is being compiled into something, uh, I think it's called just depth image. I'm not really sure how it's working, but yeah, it does. One thing that we can do in the um, console for it is we can switch on the LiDAR overlay. And uh, uh, Carlos, could you just uh, increase the size of the uh, computer screen? Thank you. So, oh, it's not showing over here. So let's just uh, reduce the size and uh, zoom in for it. Let's enable it again. So you can see uh, just sections on the screen, and this is the way LiDAR works with uh, works for uh, Evo. It just uh, detects those sections around and says if there is something in this area or not. So for now, you can see two that are slightly red. These uh, two over here. So they just detect the microphone. I'm just going to move my side on the other side, my hand on the other side, and you can see like, oh, there's my hand over here. All now, I'm just approaching from the back. I'm overtaking, and then like I'm all around because I just got too near, too close. And uh, so that's pretty much what you see, and also I believe that's what is being used as an input. So pretty much it's uh, how many sectors? Uh, one, two, three four on the right, four on the left. So it's eight sectors and it's like there's something or there's nothing. Also, one thing that I've noticed is that if I get too close, 
it doesn't detect me anymore. But too close is pretty much when I already have collided, so it doesn't really matter at that point anyway. Uh, but yeah, I just noticed that it does that. Uh, so yeah, this is what the Evo does. Uh, we can try to put it on the track. One thing is that I really don't have models that work well on it. Uh, I've only had one try with two Evos on a track and it was uh, bad. And it was pretty much driving, interesting every single box that it could see. So there's a lot of learning left for us over here. Um, but we have noticed that, first of all, they are significantly heavier because of the LiDAR on top uh, and the battery that they come with is, uh, it's like 1000 milliamps ampere hours or something like this. So it can probably drain pretty quickly. Uh, also, the computer unit battery. This is the first case that we actually need to look after the computer unit batteries as well. And uh, yeah, by the way, I just realized that I'm showing my depressor mess in the corner. Uh, well, depressor and photo mess, but yeah. So the because there is a lighter that keeps spinning all the time, the computer battery can drain pretty quickly as well. So just uh, make sure you've got a spare one if you if you plan more racing with it. And yeah, uh, I will put it on the track as well, so we can see if I manage to drive a little bit with it. Probably only in manual mode, but we'll see. So just give me a sec. So yeah, you can see that it's already detecting the bar barrier on the right, which is quite interesting. It will probably just mess it up. In normal big size trucks, there is a bit more space on the sides and especially on the one that has like one meter width, which is normal size for uh, Evo's trucks. So let's just try if we can do some manual steering with this guy. And let's see if... Uh, I'm just going to switch back to you know, like zoom out on the control so that I can see what I'm doing. And let's see if I can actually approach. Yeah, I will approach it when I switch on the other battery. Give me a sec. There we go. So yeah, that's one thing that happens quite regularly. Uh, you start your run, the car is being put on the track and you say, everything's fine, everything's ready. You press start, nothing happens. So the battery was not turned on uh, for the RC car. Let's see if we can do some riding with it. Okay, I can ride into a wall. Let's see if I can actually get out of there. to increase the power so you can see that like the power and uh, let's see uh, yeah so you can see well I'm really not sure actually right now this is something that I've learned right now really while showing it to you I'm not sure if it's actually detecting the car or just detecting the barrier. Let's see if I can. But yeah, it just got blocked. Sometimes it, it gets blocked on the steering, but let's, I'd really like to get a browser view in which you can see only the car. Uh, a little bit more. Now, I'm not going to be able to train it. Let's just move the other car a little bit so that we can see that it detects it in range. Um, 
get anything detected. I think it did, but because it's all in gray that I, can, I cannot see the red. Yeah, because we're seeing the road, it doesn't. It isn't clear that it's in red, but it's slightly reddish in those sectors right now in the browser. And uh, Carlos, if we could just switch over to the browser for a moment, or even permanently, because uh, so these sectors, because it's gray, you cannot see it, but these are slightly more red than these over here, because I've just put the car here, as you can see in the on the track. So yeah, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to show today. So uh, I'm just going to switch over to a view of me. Okay. And uh, yeah, we can just uh, okay. carry on with the questions. Of course, of course, Thomas. That was spectacular. That's uh, actually, that's the first, the first time I actually see a eraser uh on track so i uh, yeah i didn't have the opportunity to go to uh to reinvent like damien mm -hmm. so it's here damien also here again. um let me yeah, okay that's it so when i don't have the opportunity to see that actually i feel very excited about re uh, viewing how how it's really uh how how it really works and this also actually we all know we have to train uh, a lot more hours in and to make all the complete lap. So that that's all about training. Uh, also, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many how many hours it's going to take to to train uh, the racer model. You mentioned about four hours, but I think it's going to be a lot. Uh, yeah. Well, so uh, we've been organizing uh, workshops with Lyndon uh, for a short while before the lockdown happened. And uh, uh, we worked out that the absolute minimum to get a, a lap is, it's pretty much around four hours, really. So yeah, that's what we've been doing. Uh, and uh, for that, you just need to kind of pre-train it on a very simple track, like a novel one and then uh, carry on with trading on the, uh, well, we are using reInvent uh, wide track because that's what uh, we had available. And uh, that's right. yeah, th that's pretty much it. After two hours, you could get something and quite often you would just get off track all the time, stuff like that. But every now and then there would be a model that would actually train to get around the track. The thing is with the, um, the the problem is transfer from simulation to reality. You can do really nice laps in simulation, and then it will mm -hmm. ruin uh, going on track. So uh, there's a lot of factors. Like the car is a bit more wobbly on the track than it's in simulation. You get more noise from the camera. So for instance, I tried to show you the that the sector turns to a red color but you could see that there's hardly any difference because there's a bit of noise in the camera as well and then the car the car sees it in grayscale and if it's shaky it's even worse and then if you've got bad lighting conditions it affects it uh, one thing that we've noticed in the finals in 2019 was that uh, the track manager with the person that chases the car on the track was casting shadow because there was a side light and my impression was that every single time the car was in a certain sector, the shadow was in front of it and the car would just ram into the shadow on the wall. <laughs> so we could see things like that. It's quite easy to just get uh, something wrong in uh, real in reality. So it seems like the best way to train it is to do it relatively short and uh, and just hope that it will infer and not learn by heart right right uh so uh what about uh if we review a little of the questions uh i think luis here that i, I actually added to the stream here um do you have any additional questions or some kind of question you want to ask thomas about the racer mm, yes uh, hi uh I am the web developer, 
and would like to learn about this board. Um, how many costs of the of the racer vehicle is available available for anyone by it? Um, um, yes. Yeah, sorry, could you just repeat the question? Uh, so it's how many? You mean what uh, the cost is of trading? How many yeah. costs? Yes. So uh, the one hour of training right now, it's a flat rate of $3.50 in the console, uh, which might sound like a lot, but bear in mind that there were months in 2019 when one hour of training cost over $10. So uh, Amazon have done great work at just making it, let's say, reasonable. Uh, also, uh, they have. I think normally when you get when you get credits right now for SageMaker, you should they should also cover the Tracer. Just make sure that it's on the list because right now it's not the SageMaker and RoboMaker credits that cover the training. Uh, there's a separate section AWS Deep Tracer. But also, uh, I really recommend that you join the community, and there's a link right now on the screen. Uh, join deepracing.io. Remember, it's HTTP, not HTTPS, because it just redirects you to the invite, invite link for the Slack channel that we have. Because what we've got over there is we've got really great engineers such as uh, Matt Camp and Lars, Ro Lars R R Lawrence Ludwigsen. Sorry, yeah, a lot of bells. And uh, they are preparing a local training stack that you can train with on spot instances, on EC2s, on different clouds, but also locally, if you've got a computer with like a graphics card, you can just set up training yourself. And I consider this like training on steroids, but it's also much more cost-effective. Great. Uh, that was one of the answers you already, yeah, you already talked about uh, Mac, Mac Redder from the, I think it's from the Twitch chat, uh, just mentioned about uh, the local training and using the spot instances on, on local training also. Uh, or, or you can train it locally where, with, uh, for example, from uh, a video or a media instance or something like that. You can do it, right, with local training set up. Uh, please, if, if bueno, I, I, I'm going to say it in Spanish for everybody. Muchachos, if you quieren unirse, unense a la Hay mucha gente que es muchísima acá de Deep Racer y a la comunidad de Join Deep Racer IO y también a, a un Slack de Machine Learning de solamente orientado a Deep Racer. Así que les voy a pasar los, los links. Yeah, I'm going to put the links on the chat about going joining the Deep Racer community, also the Slack channel so it's going to be great for you to try all these local trainings setups for your computers uh, i i tried one of those thomas and uh, my macbook pro uh, oh, almost no, 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 blew no. out <laughs> no no notebooks no notebooks it sounds yeah, like it just works like a hair dryer and uh, until it stops working hopefully no one lost their computer because of this but uh, yeah so what uh, i would recommend is uh, either like a mid-range uh, gaming pc or if you can just assemble something with the gpu it will work but also what you can just do is uh, if you've got some credits or enough funding you can try and use these spot instances uh, so I myself, uh, I think one of the questions at the beginning that you had was like how uh, about like about me being the machine learning hero. I do know machine learning uh, at work. I'm a Java developer, so Depressor is my first contact with it. And also, well, one of the choices I made was to contribute as much as possible to the community as such. And because of that, I haven't learned much uh, outside of Depressor. I still have this on my to-do list, but I uh, like being AWS hero is a recognition of your contribution to the community or the activity. And it's not like a certificate like the ML AWS machine learning certificate that you can get. It's uh, more for like your time helping others as well to learn. And I'm sure that many people learned way more than me over the time that I've been in the community. And it's actually probably what I've been working on as well. 
so yeah, but uh, one thing that uh, we've learned as well is that, uh, or I've learned recently, is that if you use spot instances and uh, you lose them because like the resources are being just taken away from you, you might not be charged from for them. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, you can get even cheaper training with it. And also one extra thing that uh, Lars's setup does is you can use uh, multiple simulations at the same time for the training. So imagine like when you normal uh, train normally, you get the, even the behind the scenes in the new service, you've got the sage maker that just gathers experiences and does the training. And there are robo makers that run the simulation. Normally it's just one. So using local training, you can have multiple of those. So you can gather experiences from many places much faster. And why this matters is that when you're gathering experiences in RoboMaker, uh, SageMaker is, uh, is, sits there idle. If you have multiple of them, you can gather way more of them. And because of that, SageMaker has much more to do. And yes, it just keeps just, you know, milling them and getting improved models. So the training speeds up significantly as well. And with the way the way uh, it's been set up with Docker Swarm, which there's a, there's a bit of learning of the uh, tools that are being used behind the scenes. So that's the pain point of local training, really. But what you can do is you can attach multiple computers and run RoboMaker on one or two other computers and SageMaker on a different one, just focusing on the training. And uh, you can just do really nice things with it. Great, great to know. Uh, also, uh, one last question before we go with uh, the brace announcements here with Damian and um, for Latin America. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the questions. Uh, let me please um, um, just um, very quickly this. I think um, most of the people. Uh, are new in the bracer here. So, what about the cost of the bracer? Is is I think it's four hundred dollars. But at the what the difference the, the difference with the new Evo is like uh, I don't know exactly. It's like six hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, not expensive, right? Yeah, it's quite expensive. But the key thing over here is you don't need a car to train. Uh, you can start with virtual and you always need to start with virtual training and virtual racing. So I wouldn't really think about getting a car because car is just the beginning. You need a track to race on. And uh, this is also not a cheap thing, especially the full size ones. So uh, as an individual, I really recommend that you focus on virtual racing for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the chances are to race, like for instance, what you can do, and this is happening actually on Tuesday, I haven't mentioned. If you go to the community, there is an underground mm -hmm. deep racer channel. On Tuesday, there will be a live session on Twitch uh, with uh, deep racer. Uh, you can send your models to David Smith and David will load them onto a car and race them for you. Uh, from the London office. So I think it will, this one will be in London. If not, then it's happening in uh, John Meyer's ba uh, basement because there is a guy in the US that has a track in the basement. How awesome is that, right? <laughs> Actually, the, the, the real size one? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit shrunk uh, just so that it fits into the basement and his kids chase the car and do the timing and he sets up the uh, he sets up the models, loads them onto the cars and prepares them. So yeah, really awesome. And uh, and you get to join it. You can upload your models and they will be raced over there and you get feedback. So they like do their best effort. There's one model, which is like a benchmark from Darren Broderick, one of the finalists in 2019 and 2020, and probably one of my favorites because he always does really well in physical racing. So yeah, he just trained a model that does, I think, six seconds on that track because it's slightly smaller, sure. but it just goes like crazy. And, uh, and John always puts it on so you can see how it's doing. Yeah, actually I put, yeah, I put the link for the underground racing on chat. So everyone just go inside and check out and check what, what Thomas is talking about. So great, Thomas. Um, 
this is awesome. This is awesome. This is just the starting fields, the starting topics that we have to just to motivate this Latin American community here. And that's why uh, we're going to say something really good with Damien. If Damien, we're going to switch to Spanish uh, to, to just, just to say all the things. So, ah, ah come on. Uh, ahora sí, ahora sí, Damien. Ahora sí, hablemos un poquito en español. <laughs> que, me se, es que se nos cruza todas las palabras. Vamos a ver. Eh, um, Stay there, Thomas. Just just a, few, a couple of minutes before we we start, yeah. okay? Before we finish the the session, please. Ah, uh, uh, Damien, uh, you you está muteado todavía. How about now? It's okay. Okay. Awesome. okay. So before I switch Spanish, I would like to say thank you to Thomas because it was an amazing presentation and and pretty pretty practice. To, to to watch the difference be, between the cars and how to operate the cars. That was, that was really, really great. Thank Thanks, you very yeah. much. It's, it's been great to be here. And also, if I can just one sentence, you can still qualify for the finals in 2020. So there are three races, virtual ones, in the, uh, in the console right now on the October track. It looks pretty tricky, but it will be fun to train for. And also, uh, there will be most likely a chance to do a last minute qualifier. There has been one last year as well. So there will be a few places um, during the reinvent that you can qualify for. So I really recommend that you just do some training and preparation and and have fun with us over there and to follow us during the reinvent. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be awesome to one of, yeah, one of our community just qualify to I'm playing, just playing around with, with, with the racer and reviewing a little bit of code and trying, test, try and test. And then uh, we don't know, maybe you are going to be next qualifier for the reinvent sessions for the racer at, at, with the, the racer. So, so, great. Uh, so thank you, Chance, for, for sharing this and all this. The racer stuff is really awesome. And I hope we can have you again for another session before we invent. Also, it's going to be, I, I, I know it's, uh, it's difficult, but uh, we can try it. We can try. We, we're going to just announce a, a few things with Damien about the Razor. So it's maybe with these things, we can motivate uh, this uh, Peru and Argentina, Argentina and other countries to just use the Razor, involve in the Razor, and learn machine learning. Uh, a little bit of machine learning, a little bit, bit uh, of reinforcement learning, and, uh, and well, and get it, get more get more insights about uh, it's not only core AWS services around. You know, you can learn a little bit a little bit of new technologies here. Yeah, so, definitely. So thank you, Thomas, again. Really awesome presentation. Okay.